so I get to introduce our last student reader of the night, uh, Kenny Gold from Chatham. So, and I hope that I don't mess up his bio because it's on like, I'll just show this to you if you guys can see it. It like loops around because we ran out, of, we ran out of room at the end of the page. He didn't run out of room, we ran out of room. <laughs> All right. Kenny Gold is a writer and humorist currently attending chat for his fiction MFA. You can hear him this winter announcing Chatham basketball and ice hockey. Shout out to his family, boy super chill. Always gotta shout out the family. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Kenny Gold. All right, what's up? Uh, I want to thank you all for being here and uh, helping me fulfill my lifelong dream of playing a sold-out show at the Cathedral of Learning. <laughs> <laughs> um, this piece is dedicated to my brother Scott um, for asking me to write a scary story. All right, this piece is called Gehenna. When I think back now, there was nothing leading up to my uncle's suicide which suggested that anything was amiss, at least not more amiss than usual. Uncle Emmerich was strange, but we already known that. My sister Maud and I had visited his country mansion exactly once, as youths, and had been fascinated with the dusty house, decaying grounds, and our eccentric uncle himself. He'd been married then. My Aunt Millie had died in childbirth, leaving him with my cousin, Alistair. I don't remember her, and I'd never met him, but my uncle. How could I forget? In front of a roaring fireplace, he told us of the night he'd spent in a moth-ridden sleeping bag on the floor of our family mausoleum searching for evidence of the afterlife. Like ghosts, I'd ask, are they real? His dark brown eyes blazed crimson in the light. Oh, very real, he said, puffing on his pipe. Very, very real. No, perhaps the only thing I missed about the whole incident was that Uncle Emmerich had invited us at all. Throughout our childhoods and well into adulthood, he existed only as a distant specter. I think both Maud and I surprised each other by accepting his invitation. I was a bit surprised that I'd accepted myself. But two weeks in the country sounded nice, as I'd only just managed to survive the post-New Year rush and wasn't excited about the prospect of another vacation spent rubbing shoulders at a Swiss chateau or private beach resort in Majorca. And I did want to meet my distant cousin. Maud, who'd been going through a series of fantastically abysmal relationships, probably had her own reasons for coming. A train took us out of London. During the ride, I looked over some papers while Maud read a novel. She rarely talked, even to me. She was silent and brooding, half on her way to following Uncle Emmerich into reclusive obscurity. But when the hired car that took us from the train station pulled up to Uncle Emmerich's mansion, I found him to be not at all like I remembered. He was pleasant and gray-haired and jolly. His appearance invoking nostalgia for an imaginary era in British history where men wore coattails and women carried fans when it was always Christmas and snowing lightly. Come in, come in, he said, rushing to take Maud's valise. There was no doubt that he was my mother's brother. He bent and stared into her gray eyes. Ah, he said, just like Melissa's. And you, he looked at me, your mother's smile. I was so sorry to hear about her passing. Thank you for having us, Uncle Emmerich, I said, ignoring the fact that my mother had died over a decade before. <laughs> I looked past him, my eyes drifting up the facade of his palatial Gothic mansion. Unlike most things seen as a child and viewed again through the eyes of an adult, the house was bigger, just as big as I remembered, perhaps bigger. Maud and I were both quite excited by your letter, I said, which, if not the whole truth, was close enough. We very much looked forward to seeing you again. My uncle chuckled. Of course, he said, clapping me on the shoulder. My, how you've grown. It's wonderful to have you both. He lifted Maud's valise and turned to the house. Alistair, he shouted, but there was no response. He shrugged. He's a bit shy, he said. You'll meet him soon enough. Uncle Emmerich gave us a tour of the house. It was grand and old and somewhat sad. In the many years since I'd seen the place, much of the furniture had been covered with white cloth, dusty and yellowed after years of disuse. And it was confusing, far more twisted than I remembered. Several hallways seemed to lead to nowhere, and stairs that should have gone to the attic stopped halfway to the ceiling. I got lost and disoriented several times, but Uncle Emmerich always pointed out the way with a chuckle and a clap of his hands, as if he found my confusion delightful. At Alistair's door, marked with a childish keep out sticker, my uncle knocked. Alistair, he said, when no one answered, he said more loudly, your cousins are here. They've come all the way from the city. Still, there was no response. We don't want to pressure him, Maud said, merely casting her eyes toward the ground. 
Uncle Emmerich nodded. A shy boy, he said to us. And then we and Dan confided in a conspiratorial whisper, Asperger's. Uncle Emmerich seemed to understand that both Maude and I had reasons for visiting other than to see him. So after the first day, he largely left us to our own devices. On the second day, I roamed the maze-like mansion, admiring his robust collection of grandfather clocks. I also walked the expansive grounds, parading over the sea, rolling green hills, and taking a few moments of quiet meditation in one of the many copses of ancient evergreens. Maude spent her day in the solarium, writing notes in the margins of her novel. When we needed our uncle, we could find him in his book-filled study, where he was perpetually surrounded by a haze of pipe smoke mumbling about death or dying or decay. My uncle had made a career writing about the afterlife, even publishing a strange book entitled Gehenna. I found a copy on the nightstand of my sumptuous quarters. It was bound in soft red leather that felt like human skin and stamped across the front in gold typography. On my third day at the mansion, I took the solarium and perused several of the chapters. In light of my experiences, I think of the prologue. In 1935, Erwin Schrodinger came up with a famous thought experiment to de demonstrate the quantum theory of superposition, which states that the act of observing something causes it to exist, my uncle wrote. To demonstrate his theory, Schrodinger talked about placing a cat in a steel box with a flask of poison, a Geiger counter, and a bit of radioactive material so small that over the course of an hour, there was a 50% chance that the Geiger counter would pick up some radiation and a 50% chance that it would not. In the event that the counter detected radiation, the flask would shatter and the poison would kill the cat. Otherwise, the cat survived. There are two leading interpretations for this experiment, he continued. The first says that until the box is opened, the cat is 50% alive and 50% dead. It's the act of observation, opening the box, that forces the cat to take one of the states. But until that happens, the cat exists in a blurred state of both life and death. This is called the Copenhagen interpretation. The second says that opening the box creates two different realities, one where the cat is dead and another where the cat is alive. This is called the many worlds interpretation. In this book, I present a third theory, a theory guaranteed to shatter convention and shake our conception of posthumous reality. With irrevocable proof, I shall demonstrate that the simple act of observing the experiment causes the cat to live, either in life or life after death. It is only when the cat is placed in the box and forgotten, alienated from any who might reserve its passing, that the cat becomes doomed. For to make the transition without being observed, or at least remembered, is to enter the heinous, horrifying, otherworldly realm of Gehenna. And I'm going to stop there. <laughs>